Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Tom, for that really fascinating uh, presentation. I don't have a PowerPoint, um, but I have uh, quite a bit of information to share about the, um, about the about some of the subnational conflicts that are taking place in Myanmar. And we'll try to draw a little bit on um, some of the uh, findings of the Asia Foundation report and just try to consider a little bit um, what it might mean, in fact, for, um, for the conflicts that we, we're seeing in Myanmar. Um, in Myanmar, in fact, is a country where um, you, know, you, 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 in fact, see a number of different types of um, subnational conflict taking place simultaneously. Um, the, the kind of conflict uh, which was um, primarily the focus of the Asia Foundation report, um, of course, is the uh, vertical conflict, and that certainly does exist in uh, Myanmar. There are a large number of um, insurgent groups uh, in Myanmar, many of, of which have, in fact, um, entered into uh, a peace process uh, with the government um, and, in fact, have signed uh, ceasefire agreements uh, or renewed ceasefire agreements uh, quite recently since the reform process has started. But you also have um, other types of subnational conflict taking place. Um, and, and those, uh, I'll just mention two. Uh, one is the conflict in Rakhine, which um, is, some would call it intercommunal, but in, in fact, it's, it's a very complex conflict which involves statelessness. Um, I'm sure um, many of us have been uh, following uh, some of the developments there, but also there's a, a much more recent uh, form of violent conflict which has emerged um, earlier this year, which is the anti-Muslim uh, violence, in fact, which, again, you could call sectarian, but in fact um, has some incredibly complex dynamics to it. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about um, all three, primarily the, the formal peace process, which involves the ethnic insurgent groups, um, but also touch briefly on the, on the other two um, to look actually at the ways in which uh, you know, the complexities of this conflict um, actually have made it quite difficult uh, and challenging for the international community to find ways of engaging effectively, actually, in fact, in all three contexts. Um, and it's quite an interesting um, uh, situation, in fact, in Myanmar, because you see some incredible creativity in the types of ways that the international community is engaging, but you also see in um, some of the other conflicts, particularly in uh, Rakhine and, and, and in the, the anti-Muslim uh, violence uh, situation, um, actually a real lack of creativity and a, uh, quite a, you know, sort of quite traditional types of uh, approaches to aid, which in fact are not proving to be very effective at all. Um, so of course, uh, you know, we've all, I'm sure, been following uh, the rapid pace of uh, change that's been taking place um, in Myanmar. Um, particularly since the 2010 election and the um, reform agenda that was, uh, has been started by President uh, Tien Sen. Um, in 2011, there was a renewal, in fact, um, of uh, the peace process, and uh, there had been some ceasefires that had taken place prior to uh, this stage of reforms and to President Tien Sen's um, coming into power. So there was a renewal of some of those ceasefires and those uh, peace processes, but also the launch of really kind of a, a much larger um, set of um, uh, peace negotiations and ceasefire negotiations that, that have been going on. And, and that's incredibly historic. It's really the first time since uh, Myanmar's independence where you've really had uh, such a comprehensive um, process that's been taking place. And it's in no way perfect, but it certainly is, um, you know, many, many of us recognize the, actually the best chance for peace that Myanmar has had in a, in a very long time. It has resulted, in fact, um, in actually 11 uh, ceasefire uh, agreements now being signed. I mean, Kachin is still a bit tentative, but at least there's, in principle, an agreement to move towards an actual ceasefire agreement. So, so that's incredibly historic. Um, all that, of course, is taking place uh, in the context of uh, the broader reforms um, that Myanmar has embarked on. Um, so you have the political reforms, which are you know, really the transition, if you like, from sort of military authoritarian state to one which is democratic. So a lot of institutional reform, a lot of political reform. You have the economic transition, obviously, and this transition from conflict to peace is sort of the third pillar, if you like, of um, these reforms. So that process is really government-led process. There's a formal uh, you know, architecture to it. You know, the government has actually set up um, mechanisms all the way at the what they call the union level, which is really the highest uh, level in Myanmar. Um, there's a union level committee which is led by the president himself. They have a working committee um, which is led by the vice president. And there's a minister, in fact, uh, in the president's cabinet who leads on these peace uh, processes. Um, they have set up uh, 
a secretariat called the Myanmar Peace Center, which uh, functions really as a sort of support to the government's architecture um, for the peace process. And they support um, actually on many different things, but they one of their uh, uh, one of their functions really is to uh, actually track uh, the types of aid to ceasefire areas as well, uh, and to try to encourage um, engagement from uh, international partners, in fact, to, to bring in different types of aid. So it would be humanitarian, but also development and, and peace building. Um, um, the other thing they do, in fact, is also to be involved in the actual negotiations. So they are secretariat to the, the ceasefire uh, negotiations that are taking place, um, and to the political dialogue, which is going to be following those ceasefire agreements. Um, so this uh, is, is sort of the government's architecture, but then the ethnic groups also have their architecture. So they have a, a union um, sort of federation, which in fact includes uh, you know, the, uh, all the different um, ethnic groups, and some of them are still non-ceasefire, but um, there are a growing number of them who actually have entered into uh, ceasefire agreements, and they also have uh, a sort of uh, plan that's been set out and certain benchmarks which they are trying to achieve and, and ensure are being met um, through this process of negotiation. So um, within that architecture, you have, in fact, uh, you know, the international community who's really started to become, obviously, a lot more engaged uh, in Myanmar in, in this um, context of transition um, that's, in fact, tries to coordinate um, their approach to supporting uh, the peace process. And it started, really, with um, you know, certain governments, um, Norway in particular, um, having a dialogue with the Myanmar government and, in fact, being requested to, to try to support not just aid to the peace areas, or to the ceasefire areas, but in fact also um, approaches which would, in fact, support peace building. So um, the Nor Norwegian government is supporting an initiative called the Myanmar um, Peace Support Initiative, MPSI, and it's actually a very creative um, type of initiative because what it, what it does is really try to test the goodwill on all sides. So it's, it's not really um, you know, a large development uh, program or, or humanitarian aid program even, but really what it's trying to do is to find particular areas in some of the ceasefire uh, regions where in fact you can try to facilitate much more dialogue between the state actors and the non-state armed actors um, and communities in fact, and try to bring in you know, a, a whole range of stakeholders to, to actually build confidence in that peace process and including um, you know, some uh, flows of humanitarian aid and development aid and, and a discussion on how to start extending services to those areas. So it's not a large program, but it's quite an effective one because it has actually shown that in some of these areas you actually can build trust and you can start to have aid flows go in to these areas in a way which in <coughs> fact builds confidence. Um, you then had uh, the setting up of um, a peace donor support group which, uh, in fact, is a, a number of uh, key donors who are committed to supporting the peace process, and they've come together um, really also at the request of the Myanmar government to um, <coughs> try to ensure that there's a, a coordinated approach to aid. Now, I think uh, that you know, the, the Myanmar government probably had quite different expectations, in fact. I mean, they were sort of expecting huge aid flows to start you know, coming in once this uh, process started, and, in fact, that it hasn't really led to that. You know, there's... Um, the Peace Donor Support Group meets regularly, um, and, and there's been discussion, obviously, on you know what the various needs are. But um, but the interesting thing is that it's, it's quite a creative way because you know donors are actually quite conflict sensitive in this area, and they they are not willing to flood the areas with aid. They're quite uh, interested, actually, in making sure that they understand the the, the dynamics um, that are taking place. They are very you know concretely behind. Uh, definitively behind the, the peace process, which is being led by the government, but at the same time, they're also quite careful about what the implications of, um, you know, the different types of aid approaches that they might be supporting, in fact, are. Um, now, to, to touch on the other two uh, conflicts, you have, you know, in the other extreme, uh, in fact, um, you know, another area of the country. It is, in fact, a, a, an area that borders um, Bangladesh, but it's a very different kind of conflict in fact, and uh, this is Rakhine State, which borders Bangladesh, and it is an area, in fact, where you do also have one armed group, so there's a Rakhine um, armed group, in fact, of you know uh, ethnic Rakhine, uh, primarily Buddhists, who, in fact, are also involved in a, an insurgent movement against uh, the state, 
Um, but the, the, pr the primary source of conflict there really is uh, the conflict uh, between the Rakhine Buddhists and the stateless Muslims, the, the, who are known as the Rohingya. Um, and that has been uh, a conflict dynamic. Well, there's, it's been a pattern of exclusion and discrimination, which has gone on for many decades. But there was an outburst uh, last year, which started um, um, in, in late May, June, and, and you know, flared up again in October. And it's led to massive displacement, about almost uh, 200,000 people displaced, um, and a currently still an enormous humanitarian crisis. And in fact, you know, the number of IDPs, um, as well as the conditions in, in a humanitarian sense, are far worse in Rakhine State than they are in most of the ceasefire um, and even non-ceasefire areas that are taking place with the ethnic um, conflicts. And there what you have, in fact, is you know, quite a lot of engagement from um, the international community, but it's primarily through humanitarian aid. And uh, you know, there, there's been, and still very underfunded, um, but there's been very little um, attempt to actually try to engage on solving the political aspects of, of this um, problem. And I think that you know, that is where you actually see you know, quite a contradiction in terms of you know, very sensitive kind of uh, approach and engagement uh, on the one hand for the ethnic conflict, but I, I, you know, on, on the Rakhine crisis, in fact, really just insufficient um, political uh, um, engagement, if you like, uh, in a coordinated way. You know, it's not to say that nothing's happened and there's been no advocacy. There certainly has been, but not in a really uh, coordinated way, not, um, uh, certainly not in a very effective way at all. Um, and then you've had very recently, uh, in, it started really in, in, in March, or the violence actually started in March, although the, um, the sort of organizing around this uh, uh, started uh, quite a bit earlier. But in, in March, you had an outbreak of violence uh, in central Myanmar, in <coughs> fact, uh, which was also targeting Muslims, but really targeting Muslim citizens, in fact. So it's quite different from the violence that you see in Rakhine State, which is, is, is really quite a, a sort of, you know, racial and, and uh, a sort of ethnic rather than uh, primarily religious. Um, but the, the violence which took place um, is still actually being uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, organized and, and uh, fueled is in fact um, um, targeting citizens uh, who are Muslim, um, who, are being who are seen to be uh, either foreigners or you know, a threat in an economic sense. Um, and there's been really very little engagement from the international community on that issue. I mean, it's, it hasn't resulted in the same level of displacement uh, uh, or humanitarian needs, but it's certainly a very serious problem. And I think it's a problem which, in fact, the international community finds quite hard to conceptualize and to respond to. So, so if we look then at you know, implications of the way in which the international community is, is engaging, I mean, just, just in one country, which has you know, these different types of uh, you know, typologies of uh, conflict and violence, it's not uh, a given in any way that even if you, know, you have actually quite creative and effective approaches to conflict in uh, one part of that country to a particular type of conflict that you're necessarily going to have effective or creative approaches in the other parts of the country. So I'll just end there and uh, we can go into discussion later. Thank you very much.